today in discovering Kazakhstan, we're in the south of the country, in the Zhambil region. And in this episode, we're going to discover the city of Taraz. It's a very ancient city. And we're starting the program actually east, a long way east of the city, uh, out towards the steppes, um, where there's this very ancient town. In fact, it goes to the prehistory of Taraz, and it's called Akirtas. The ancient 8th century township of Akirtas was built on the exposed open plains, 40 kilometers from Taraz, in the foothills of the Kyrgyz Alatau, and most probably related to the Silk Way. But more mystery surrounds this enigmatic construction than facts. We've made our way up the track in the car and we've managed to arrive at, uh, at the old town that's here. This building that I'm studying at the moment is um, uh, a museum and it'll also be like a, a guest reception centre when it's finally finished built. At the moment it's still under construction, but actually I'm very glad that it's here. It's very bleak and exposed in this part of the world and at the moment the weather's not terribly good so I've had to put on some extra clothes uh, to try and protect myself. But now we're going to go and have a look inside the old town of Akiratas and I'll tell you a bit more about this ancient city. Nobody really knows why it was built and then abandoned. This was originally constructed as a fortified town and what we're looking at here is one of the corner towers of, of the town walls. And you can see how strongly it was built. Very thick walls. The foundations are uh, deeper than two meters. And you can see this, uh, this well uh, that's around this construction here. But look at the kind of stone that they've got. It's this very beautiful red color. And this is a special red sandstone. The latest technology has been used to probe the ground beneath the structure, revealing a complex network of foundations up to four meters deep, indicating the constructor's skills and the intended grandness of the final building, which was forever to be left unfinished. Over in that direction, uh, beyond the blue sign there, there's uh, the remnants of a very old building. At the moment, it's just stones that are scattered around the countryside, but originally it was the house of the builders of this place where they would live uh, while they were constructing the rest of the fortified town. Now, the architecture of the place is actually quite interesting. It's not um, local architecture, that's for certain. And the actual uh, war at that time, in, in 751 AD, was between Arab and China. Now, the Arabians were the ones who constructed or influenced the construction of this building because it's very definitely Arab architecture. It's not Chinese architecture, it's not local architecture. So, uh, again, we don't really know who built it, but we know that it was built to their construction. Whether or not they um, decided to abandon the place after the war with China had finished or not, we're not quite sure. This is a plan of the town inside these gates. And there's a few things that are quite worthy of pointing out here. First of all, a very large area of the town is open courtyard. So this could have been anything. This area of open space here is believed to have been the foundation of the construction of a mosque. Now, Islam didn't actually come to Central Asia until three or four centuries after this. So that's another theory about, well, maybe the um, Arabian people came to Central Asia uh, on a crusade, uh, wanting to generate uh, the Islamic faith within the area, abandoned this project and left, and then Islam wasn't uh, introduced into the country until later. Again, we don't know, all of this is speculation. It's a very mysterious place, this. Also, at the corners, uh, th this is the um, tower where we started talking earlier on about this town. And behind that tower, there are these very long rooms here. They're between one and a half or two meters wide, but they're about 18 meters long. Why were they there? Now, the main entrance to the town is here. And I'm gonna show you that now. And something very interesting about that is that the stonework is completely different. Now, we all know that the entrance to our house or to the entrance to the city should look magnificent. It should look wonderful because this is where you're going to have all your guests arrive. Um, everybody who's important, who's going to come to your town, are going to come through those gates. So they've got to look perfect. Well, the gates behind me, if I can show you here, are perfectly constructed. They're all geometric. They've all been squarely finished off and they all look very, very good indeed. But the rest of the walls have all been 
created from these very rough hewn blocks like that you can see there. Maybe they built the entrance first and then later on they were uh, in such a hurry before the Chinese arrived to get the thing finished that they, they were less careful. We don't know and it's unlikely that we'll ever know. Despite the rough finishing of many of the blocks used in the walls, evidence is lying around the site of high precision stonemasonry with accurate profiling and precisely chiselled blocks for more intricate elements of the construction. This is the room that uh, is believed to have been the mosque and archaeologists and other experts have examined this area and they believe it to be a mosque for a number of reasons. Um, one is the actual orientation of it and the fact that the west wall is very much like the altar that you would find normally in a mosque on that wall. Also the, the columns, the positions of the columns and the meaning of them all indicate that this was indeed a mosque at that time. Well I've come off the main corridor here onto this smaller corridor into what looks like it was a, a living accommodation at that time. There are a number of small rooms here that have come off this corridor but you know this was never finished it was never fully constructed so there was never a roof on this place so we don't actually know how it would have looked when it was completed we know that the open area in the middle was a co courtyard and probably wouldn't have had a roof on it anyway um, but all of this area around the outsides of the of the town would definitely have been covered at some point in time it isn't difficult to imagine the imposing beauty of this grand fortified township on the desolate plain with the Kyrgyz Alatau mountains in the background the striking vivid red colour of the stones and the town's abandoned isolation were mentioned in travellers' diaries as far back as the 13th century. Well, does this remind you of anywhere? It reminds me certainly of Scotland. And you can see behind me the mountains with the snow on the top. The weather's not great, there's a bit grey in the sky. And look at all this, the lichen that has grown on these rocks. Um, it's a very damp kind of place, but also strikingly beautiful, just the same as Scotland is. Well, we come along the main corridor from the main entrance there into this courtyard and you can see, if we look around, just how big this courtyard is. And, you know, at that time when this place was built, it was very standard to build the plan of a town around a big square courtyard uh, like this. And because this was built as a fortified town, it's most probable that this courtyard was used to keep the horses that were needed for, for the uh, soldiers. One of the main reasons why many people come here is because of two rocks that are in this particular part of the courtyard. Uh, these are said to have magical properties and this rock here is said to have healing properties. People come here, they touch the rock, uh, they also uh, make wishes for their futures and, and it's said to come true. The rock here is also said to have a different temperature to the one over here, which is called the throne for obvious reasons. And uh, this rock is also one where people make wishes. And who knows? We don't know. Local people, they say that they have magical properties. Who are we to say that they don't? Maybe they do. And continuing the comparison with Scotland, you can see here this cairn. Well, actually, it isn't a cairn. It's a pile of stones that have been put here by people who've made wishes. So the usual process is that they come here, they make a wish on one of the two big stones over there, and then they place a rock on top of this one uh, to create something that looks like a Scottish directional cairn. Virtually nothing is known of the origin of this ancient edifice, but what is certain is that it was a bold and grand statement of a rich and powerful person who had access to vast resources of manpower and technology which was rare at that time, as well as a vivid imagination. This wide corridor that I'm walking along here isn't really a corridor, it's more of a, a cloister, because these are enormous columns. They're the bases of columns that would have reached right up to a, a very high ceiling. Beyond there is the open space of the central courtyard, and on that side there's the walls um, that go off to the, the rooms and the mosque, on this side. So what we're looking at here is a magnificent square colonnaded cloister. It's fantastic. And at the end of there, we're going to have a look at those very mysterious long thin rooms that look as if there were some kind of labyrinth that was created. 
what on earth is this all about? This is incredible, and nobody knows why it is. If we look at it, we've got three, what appear to be corridors, but they're not corridors because they don't go anywhere, yeah? There's uh, about a meter and a half wide. There's this long room that goes down the center. There's another one, and there's a third one there. And they're separated by walls that are, th that are thicker than the rooms. We can't think why these would have been created. Now, that room at the end there goes to a dead end. This part here, however, is a bit different because this room has got some kind of connection with the next room. So that makes it look as if it's part of a labyrinth of some kind. But then why would they create a labyrinth that has only got two rooms with a third room that's got no connection to it? It doesn't seem to make sense. So there are other theories as to what these might have been. And one of the main theories about this is that they could have been storerooms. So you could use these areas for storing things at the sides, creating a very narrow corridor down the middle. But again, it doesn't really make sense. On this side of the town, there are three of these rooms. On the other side, if we go right to the other end there, there are five of them. So there's this other mysterious aspect of asymmetry, which nobody can really work out. I'm not sure that any of these problems will ever be solved, but it would be wonderful if they were. The bright red sandstone was hewn from a quarry more than half a kilometer away from the construction site at the top of a difficult incline. Some of the stones were a meter and a half in length and nearly a meter's width and height in cross section, presenting a significant transport challenge for the eighth century. Now, this place is high up above the town and we can see around us the fantastic countryside. I'm gonna take you into the place where the rich people used to live while they were waiting for the town to be built. Well, we're inside the building now and each of these little rooms was one place within the building. So they were separate rooms, not separate houses. And when they were built, they were, each of the rooms had its own little cupola on top of it. That, of course, has, has long been gone. Uh, but when they excavated this area, they were very quick in preserving it to treat the clay to make sure that it doesn't degrade any further. That was very important. The archaeologists have been working in here to find out as much as they can. And you can see the construction of it. And you can see the bricks, particularly in this wall, you can see the layers of clay brick that have been fired and put into position there. And then behind me here, you can even find a little oven. And I must admit, coming out from the, the fields out there to here, even without a fire burning in the oven, I'm still feeling a little bit warmer than I was before. This is where the quarry was, where they um, dug out the rocks that they used for building the town. And they had to take them all the way down the hill, down to the town, which is over there behind the museum in the distance. Well, we've come down to the source of the stone used to build Akirtas, and you can see the colour of it is this beautiful, deep, rich red colour. And it's also, incidentally, evident here, the source of the name of Akirtas. There are two meanings of it. It can be either a bowl for cattle, like this, somewhere from which they can drink or eat, or it can actually mean cornerstone, the cornerstone of a building. The archaeologists believe that this stone structure here was used as a, as a means of strengthening the building. So you can imagine that there's a stone here with a, um, a small indent within it, and there'll be another stone with a projection of the same size in it, and they'd fit together like two Lego bricks and stop them from sliding against each other. Well, that's brought us to the end of this voyage of discovery around the little city of Akirtas, an ancient place, very interesting. And you can see behind me, uh, the museum is looking very, very good. It's not ready yet, but soon it will be. And I would recommend that anybody comes and sees this place for themselves and discovers Akirtas uh, for themselves. So join me again next time uh, to discover more of the country in discovering Kazakhstan. <laughs>